thank God the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, uh, good morning, colleagues who are on site, and good uh, afternoon, evening for anyone else who are on Zoom. Uh, I'm sorry I can't make it. I really was planning and looking forward to coming here to actually meet with a lot of interesting colleagues and I'd like to know uh, you better. But uh, unfortunately, due to the uh, COVID and some other uh, issues uh, uh, that I can't make it. So my topic today is uh, to present more or less four, um, uh, four pieces of work, basically. They are somehow related. So the first one is um, about uh, a seamless data cube of satellite data uh, construction. And then from this, we can do all sort of information extraction. In this case, I present you land cover mapping and change extraction. So you can see this is a paper published uh, last year in remote sensing environment. Um, we call this product sets uh, IMAP World 1.0. Um, we all know that satellites, uh, hundreds of satellites are flying over in the space, collecting images. Um, so millions of uh, satellite data are being collected, but they are collected at different time, different days, under different weather conditions. So when such data are collected, you, the best you can correct for the geometry, so space-wise they are right, and then stack them together piece by piece. Each image is covering a small area of the world. So you can actually put all of them together in, into a stack. We call it piecewise raw data cube. Because then you can, for one position, you can pull all the information from uh, this uh, vertically a long time. Or you can do things in space. So, but this kind of data, as I mentioned, they are discontinuous. The frequency varies at different location. And they are not, uh, uh, the quality are uh, not of the same. You know, if you have fog, you have cloud, then you don't have good quality data. So in order to overcome this problem, in the recent years that people proposed that uh, concept of you know, seamless data cube, in the uh, hope that we are able to produce data uh, that in space, they are continuous of same quality with no wasting, you know, for example, cloud covered areas. Everywhere we have, we have the data. And also in time, we could say that, say, how about daily? You know, can we produce daily data sets? So in this paper, the production of uh, um, seamless data cube for Landsat data. We all know Landsat was launched. The first uh, date was in uh, 1972. So it has a long history. But the data archive, the best uh, and the more uh, richer volume of data are being accumulated since uh, we could say around 1985 or 84. So that's why there are lots of data archived in chips. We, we could take advantage of all of those data and produce something like what we have on the right, you know, seamless data cube. Uh, before I go further, you know, uh, we have this kind of data actually, uh, which means it opens a door for us to do a lot of things. Now, one example is to do image classification. So I'd like to share with colleagues that gave you some uh, rough uh, review on what is involved in image classification. So the goal is to make maps. For example, this, this is our uh, final destination, 
but we need to prepare the data. So seamless data cube is one way that solves the problem on the geometrical quality, solves the problem on radiometric quality. So we can restore that. Uh, we even can assume that topography can be flattened. Um, we can remove cloud and we need to fill in the missing data. So there are various ways for people to do it. After you have the data in traditional uh, image classification or mapping, we start from the imagery, we go to image classification. That means that we use certain uh, uh, algorithm uh, that can be uh, applied to the image and to tell us what type of surface cover um, it is, or land use it is, or anything that we want to extract uh, from the uh, raw imagery or processed imagery to a uh, you know, category. So from those categories, eventually we are able to uh, prepare maps. Now, in the image classification, in order to do that, lots of people try to derive additional information from the original imagery we call to produce features. So feature is an important thing to extract. And now we have a rich uh, stack of information in time series. So we can do a lot of time series analysis. Time series analysis allow us to detect change, basically. You can do change from here. You can also do change by comparing maps. Uh, derived from different dates of the data. So you, you know land cover or land use changes. And of course, we need some algorithm to do that. Nowadays, most people use machine learning algorithms. One type of the classification need to be, uh, the classifiers need to be trained. So it's a supervised classification. You need to collect samples. The samples means that from the imagery, you know, you, you can label each individual pixel or one patch of the imagery with different type of classes that we want to eventually produce the map for. So we could do them in pixel-based sample collection or image chip-based uh, collection. I will uh, go back to this, why I have image chips collection to, uh, for mapping. So this is a basic review. So the three uh, critical components or elements in mapping uh, is data. We need to prepare them as good as possible, as consistent as possible, so that the, the more consistent we can produce the data into the, their original physical condition, the easier for us to use you know, samples collected in different times that we could still apply them to the data. And the classifier is used, taking the samples to train the classifier, apply to the data, eventually to derive the maps for us. And the samples can also be used to validate maps. So of course, they need to be independent sets of samples. So with millions of Landsat imagery from 1985, to 2020, we developed a seamless data cube. So this actually involved, you know, data cube preparation, spatial temporal cube uh, reconstruction. That means you have missing data, you have to fill it. You have gaps, you have to fill it. So some of the concept I already mentioned. Then we pull all the data into a data lake, remote sensing data lake. And we also need to prepare the samples, uh, right? So that, and also extract features, and eventually we can apply the algorithm to the data lake, eventually to derive the classification results and allowing us to do post-classification processing. We did this all in Amazon using more than 10,000 uh, core uh, cloud computing. So um, it cost us about 2 million US dollars to be able to prepare all the world on a daily basis. So from 1985 to 2020, a seamless data queue. With that, 
we are able to basically map a land cover on every day because we have daily data set. We could do every day. Of course, normally we don't do that because we, need, we do not need that detailed amount of information. We can do it for every um, season. So sometimes seasonal data is useful for applications like you know, climate related studies. We could also do that on an annual basis. So we produce from 1985 to 2020, a 36 uh, layer of global land cover you know, on an annual basis. As I, as I said, from the seamless data cube, you can produce all sorts of you know, data layers. For example, albedo, for example, you know, leaf area index, for example, population, for example, urban uh, extent, uh, for example, urban land use, for example, you know, wetland, uh, lakes, uh, you know, whatever feature you try to extract from that. So what I present, you know, in that particular paper in remote sensing environment, we further did I map the world. So that's a global cover. If we summarize all the pixels, we do a statistics from 1985 on an annual basis to take a look at how the forest areas are changing. So this is the curve we get. So annual trend of forest, um, grassland, bare land, water, uh, cropland, and you know, basically each one of them re represent one, one different uh, land cover. This is the annual land cover trend in the statistics of the whole world, you know, in, their, in terms of uh, uh, 10 million of uh, uh, kilometers, square kilometers. We could also do seasonal trend. You can see that some of the forest, you have deciduous forest. So forest leaves uh, are up or down, you know, in summer or winter. Uh, grassland also, you know, so there are many uh, lakes are coming on down due to flooding season or what, whatsoever. So lots of the categories actually has seasonal patterns. But normally, you know, not so obvious for, you know, uh, urban human settlement land and, uh, you know, permafrost or, you know, ice and snow covered areas, they are much smaller. They are changing. So we can also take a derivative using, not derivative, compare all the annual changes with 1985 to see whether or not, you know, the general trend of the global land cover, some of the areas are increasing. For example, water surfaces, for example, cropland, but for forest, the whole world is actually having a declining trend during the past 35 years uh, in the time we mapped. So this can be done for every country, every city, every province, every state, anywhere, you know, because we have produced this data set. So this is basically a presentation, uh, introduction about the kind of technology using cloud computing that we are able to achieve nowadays, not uh, down before, you know, pe people before cannot really do for global data so easily to make maps on an annual or seasonal basis for such a long time period. So this kind of data, the seamless data cube, as I said, is the raw satellite imagery standardized so that we can derive all sorts of other information. But the global land cover trend and change data set can also be used for other applications. So before I, I further continue this, I want to uh, do a little bit theoretical uh, introduction about how we were able to do this uh, seems to be relatively easily. We know data, we need to pro prepare them and satellite con continuously collect them for us. The AI and machine learning uh, scholars in this community, people develop all sorts of classifiers. Really what we did for global land cover is to have a complete and timely invariable sample set. You know, that can be applied to data in any year 
of satellite image. Say we collect the data in 2015 as a sample. Would they be applicable to data, uh, satellite data in 1985? The answer is yes. You know, there are some conditions to do that. Basically, these are the three component, like uh, element, like what I mentioned earlier. So in 2019, we published a paper in Science Bulletin in China uh, called Stable Classification with Limited Samples. The reason goes back to here. Is data more important or classifier more important or samples are important? So they are all important. You know, we need all of them, but Data can be refreshed all the time. Sample, if you, you try to do the sample collection every time, it's going to be very labor intensive. And classifiers are relatively ready. But are they, you know, can you blindly just select one classifier? You don't really need to worry about the classifier uh, selection for the global land cover classification. Certain classifier may be good for specific theme of classification but they may not be good for uh, certain areas. But we find at a global scale, the most important thing is actually, you know, uh, having a good uh, set of samples. And you don't need a lot of samples. As long as those samples are sufficient, you should be able to apply them to the whole world. And as a global scale, the classification can be stable. Our uh, proposition for that came from, you know, sample requirements uh, analysis using local areas. So we selected 13 classifiers. Some of them are, are in sample classifiers. Some of them are the traditional statistical classifiers, such as maximum likelihood classification, such as linear uh, discriminant analysis, those kind of things. Uh, the complicated ones, including, you know, neural network. Some of them are single uh, uh, classifiers, some of them are ensemble classifiers. So we tested them in a local area of eight uh, classes in Guangzhou. It's a subtropical city. So urbanized area usually are relatively complex. So we choose the city like that to do the experiment. Our uh, idea was to see if we vary the sample size from 20 per class to 240 classes, these are all very carefully visited class uh, samples and apply it to satellite Im images and using different classifiers. This is basically when your sample size is very small, you know they are not sufficient. So the classification accuracy is low, but gradually they converge you know, converge to a certain range that none of the classifiers, all the classifiers can reach a certain level of high accuracy. You know, the variation among them actually is um, about 5% or so. But the sample size variation causes 10 to 20% of the accuracy uh, change. Um, this is basically to show the classifier, their performance actually are smaller. So about 5% difference when we try to use them. So this gives us a lot of interest to look into the, the sample. You know, having a full set of sample of 240, or can we use a small subset of sample still achieve relatively good uh, accuracy? So we did something, you know, when we, uh, reduce the sample size, the classification accuracy could still be you know, relatively uh, high. So that's basically what um, motivated us to do global land cover mapping, also try to do this. I'm sorry for the Chinese character for some of the colleagues, but you can just see, uh, you don't need to pay attention to that. I can clearly explain to you how we did this. We have a global set of sample. The total we can see 100% of the global set of samples. We could use the samples to train a classifier. In this case, we use the random forest. And then we could 
uh, estimate, use another set of samples to test the uh, random forest classifier and try to get the classification accuracy. The accuracy we call overall accuracy in percentage. You can see when the sample size increases that the accuracy stabilizes. They become within 1%, you know, less than 1%. Starting from about 40% of the sample, you can achieve, you know, very stable classification accuracy. So this is the, the using 10,000 runs. So that means when you have a smaller set, to say 40% of the sample which we draw from the total sample, we could do 1,000 runs randomly. And then you see the variability, the standard deviation is very small. So that gives us a lot of encouragement in the future, we could actually use a smaller set of samples to do global land cover mapping. We also did something, we know that samples are um, error, erroneous. You know, some samples, even though we try to do very good job, samples may not be totally correct. So if we on purpose uh, try to alter the samples, so we can add uh, artificial error into the sample. When we begin to pure sample, adding 5% of erroneous into the sample and gradually adding more, we find by adding up to 20% of the errors into the sample of training, we still have a relatively st stable classification accuracy. So this is basically the piece of work we tried to study you know, with, uh, with one single classifier of global land count cover sample sets, we are able to achieve some uh, insight. So that means, oh, we don't really care so much if we, our samples are wrong by 20%, we may still be able to get relatively reasonable classification accuracy. What is the implication of this? This means if the global land cover area changes, you use a mismatch of sample set. You collect a sample in 2015, but your data is actually 1985. Would it be still uh, okay to apply the sample collected in a different time to, to classify uh, the data in a different year? The whole world, the land cover didn't change by 20% in 20 years. If it changed that much, we probably wouldn't be able to hold the change, you know. So, um, that's why we, we find that we could use samples collected in one time and to be able to apply it to multiple years, basically in the whole uh, 20, uh, 36 years of time. Our uh, result has been repeated by some other people doing work in urban land use mapping. So they find uh, some similar uh, rules like this. We additionally experimented with some other classifiers. Now using other classifiers, you can still find similar results. I will not spend more time to talk about that uh, for too much. So the third piece of work I want to introduce to colleagues is, uh, you know, the three meter resolution global land cover map. So we collaborated with Sense Time. It's a, a company that they, they do actually uh, face recognition in China. But they also have access to acquire data from Planet. We all know Planet has hundreds of satellites uh, flying over uh, the space and collecting three meter global, land, uh, global uh, data sets. Uh, on average, they could do it uh, every two days, uh, imaging the whole world. So we collected one set of their three meter resolution data. Uh, we were able to um, map uh, the whole world. So we actually did 30 meter mapping, the first e example. And in the second example, actually it's transferring 30 meter uh, samples to map 10 meter 
European, you know, uh, uh, sentinel uh, data to produce global land cover at 10 meter resolution. And now I'm trying to show you that we completed a data that is three meter. So this is a three meter resolution data from Google image you can use as a reference. You know, three meter on all the villages that can be mapped. And uh, you know, this is our 10 meter resolution. This is our 30 meter resolution. And there are some other global products, you know, that 30 meter resolution, uh, uh, 500 meter, 300 meter resolution, and 500 meter resolution. So these are basically some global land cover products, but none of them have annual uh, data capability for the whole world uh, at 30 meter resolution. And this is the only one three meter resolution uh, data layer. So basically you can, you can tell the spatial details that you can get, you know, including urbanized areas, agricultural, land areas, even the golf course, you know, are detailed map. And, you know, in some of the desert areas that you could actually get uh, a much better mapping of all the circular features. The reason I want to show you colleagues, earlier, all the maps are mapped at up to 10 meter are on the single pixel base, but the three meter we used you know, image chips. We used, you know, the deep uh, learning algorithms uh, to do the three meter uh, classification. So your sample set need to be expand expanded or augmented to image chips. So each sample is one image chip. That's why at the beginning I said, we need to do image chip collection to form uh, uh, the training sample. So uh, again, you know, at the global scale, you know, trying to look at the product as three meter resolution doesn't really help us uh, a lot. Uh, so they are, they are similar to a 30 meter resolution when we look at them at this level of detail. So um, I'm sorry for, uh, these are basically agricultural forest land, you know, for different type of land. They're, uh, producer's accuracy and user's accuracy. So I tried to show you that with three meter resolution, the overall accuracy can be better than 80%. So my uh, last uh, set of slides is to show you that to study the impact of urbanization on climate. Uh, last year, we published a paper on China's urbanization and uh, how it affect uh, the global climate. So we find actually the winter warming in North America has been induced by China's urbanization. We all know that China's urbanization has uh, expanded uh, no, uh, the, the greatest in the past uh, 30 years. So that's why we started this particular study. Instead of most people study how the climate change impact urban areas, we use urban uh, land expansion to study their effect on the uh, climate. So recently, these are uh, the three meter resolution mapping and also this set of slides are not published yet. So recently we do a global uh, study. So uh, we find um, observations uh, showed that urban weight warming is greater than the background climate warming. I mean, in rural uh, areas, but except for South Asia, you know, there are some reasons. You see, for North America, the urban weighted uh, warming, you know, from 1985 to 2015, is a red line, and the uh, background is a blue line. So in North America, in the 1990s, there was also, you know, urbanization actually are having a cooling effect, but not anymore after 1998 or so, okay? So because there is an urban uh, 
heat island, there's also an urban sink island. So uh, we, we have published some work on that before. If you look at East Asia, the effect is very obvious. You know, urban areas has a much stronger, you know, uh, heating uh, effect. And Europe uh, also, you know, not so obvious, but South Asia, you know, in the past 10, 20 years, that they have a much stronger, you know, urbanized area are actually having, uh, uh, are acting less, uh, uh, contributing less to the, the heat. So we also find that the intensity of extreme heat in the urban areas is increased more seriously than that with the background climate, that in rural areas. So there are some examples for North America, East Asia, and Europe. Uh, again, you know, in uh, South Asia, there are some uh, effects, which is a little bit, uh, you know, the whole world at different times may have different effects. Uh, basically, we can't really see um, they are all consistently at the same time. We all know in, in California now, uh, you can't really irrigate uh, your lawn because of water shortage. So everybody, every family in their uh, garden, they are trying to plant, not, no, not uh, uh, any more grass, but they try to use some, you know, uh, uh, desert area plant, you know, water conservation plants in their garden. So uh, obviously if we, we water our uh, garden, then that will have a cooling effect uh, to the urban area. So that's, more or less the reason. So we uh, using urban land area and land cover uh, from uh, 1985 and 2015 in the 30 year period, we could compare um, their difference. Uh, in this case, we, we compared 1985 to 2018. And uh, so there's the urban land expansion so we could run models using NCARS uh, uh, community uh, common uh, earth system model. We could actually st uh, simulate the global um, uh, local land cover change, urban land cover contribution to climate. So we find that in North America, in Europe, their urbanization rate didn't expand, you know, in about 30 some years time didn't expand a lot. And East Asia and South Asia actually expanded a lot more than the developed uh, regions in the world. And we find uh, we could actually attribute to uh, uh, temperature uh, increase or temperature decrease uh, by some of the uh, uh, factors such as, um, you know, uh, albedo change. I don't really have all of that uh, uh, clearly uh, listed here for you, but basically, you know, uh, albedo change, emissivity change, um, aerodynamics resistance change, evaporation resistance change, you know, different factors we can see uh, consistently, you know, the um, evaporation uh, resistance change contribute uh, a lot in East Asia, not in South, uh, Asia, but also in North America and Europe. So basically you can attribute using the models to attribute what factor contributes the most in the urban area that, you know, that the urban area are being altered some of the physical properties and each one of these physical properties uh, could contribute to the uh, temperature change. So we did some study um, also focusing on uh, regional uh, effects. We find that, uh, you know, uh, there are different degrees of warming for the same level of urban expansion. So in Europe, if urban expansion by 1%, it, you know, has the greatest impact of uh, a temperature increase. And North America is also uh, very strong. Uh, China is less and South Asia is even uh, less. So that's basically uh, the kind of message that uh, we learn from uh, 
you know, what I tried to show you, uh, some of the studies we did. And we have some ongoing parallel works. For example, how future urbanization in different parts of the world would affect uh, climate. Um, we're working on a paper on that. We are also doing urban systems modeling. Can we model the climate system like, uh, can we model the urban system like we, we model the climate system? So we, are, uh, uh, we have a group of people working on this. We're also assessing urban development and urban health. So we have a, a city health outlook work uh, of the world. And we recently published a paper on the population exposure to the green, greenness in cities. And we find the global south and global north uh, differences. That is uh, going to appear in nature communication very soon. So with all of that, colleagues, I will stop here. I want to acknowledge uh, some of the contributors to this set of work, mostly from uh, um, my colleagues uh, in China for this set of work. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <clears throat> so do we have questions? No questions online. So one question I have, uh, 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 so Steph. is a really fantastic uh, set of data that you have shown us. Uh, I, I wonder um, what information can you take from this data on the status uh, and the characteristic of the ocean uh, uh, about that? Did, did you, there is any work that you have done already or, or, or not? Okay, um, I, the reason I want to uh, share with you, uh, colleagues, I couldn't really uh, gave you a link for this particular set of work. Uh, we used Amazon. Originally, they gave us 20, uh, 200,000 uh, US dollar computing. And I, uh, I, it, I ran over and I was able to test all the uh, results and uh, algorithm methodology, but the data has been upheld by Amazon. I need to give them the money in order to make the data to, to do further work. So uh, because I can't really assemble enough money, so I, I, I might have to redo it in a, a cheaper place. I, this is all very frank, colleagues. I haven't been able to do further you know, uh, analysis of the data set we produced. But we are uh, hoping by the end of the year, we will totally reproduce the data in Pengcheng Lab. Remember, I, I mentioned a group of colleagues that the first uh, group actually is in Pengcheng lab in Shenzhen. So they have the cloud computing allowing us to do continuous work. Oh, sorry. I mean, this is only one part of it. Uh, so for a lot of data we, can, we are able to share, for example, the global urban extent um, from 2000, uh, 1985 to 2018. So, uh, and also the, uh, uh, some of the urban uh, land use uh, data, global land cover 10 meter, uh, global land cover, you know, uh, 30 meter are also shareable, uh, not uh, on the annual basis, but uh, on some selected years. Uh, hello, Peng. Uh, Sandra Diaz here. Um, I have a question uh, related to the ongoing parallel work. You mm -hmm. mentioned in the last point inequality of urban population exposure to green environments. Mm -hmm. I wonder if you can um, share just a little bit of what are you finding there, because I, I find it extremely important. How about this? I will share you with the manuscript uh, through uh, uh, Masili. Um, so um, uh, basically we find that the global south uh, cities are actually having a um, substantially lower you know, uh, exposure to green space areas. Thank you. Brian? Hello, thank you for the presentation. Uh, maybe somewhat of a 
technical question, but early on when you um, had several different um, classifiers that you were using with the um, the urbanization effect, and you mentioned that the sample size made a big difference, right? But actually what I took from that graph was that the, the method you used was a bigger determinant. In some cases, even with 20 sample size, you got as good of results as with, yeah, this one exactly. So like LR and LMT are just as good with a small sample size as some of the other ones are with a larger sample size. And so I'm just wondering like if, if your conclusion was more about which of the different um, methods you're using rather than sample size. Because I assume there's also a trade-off in time of effort with the larger sample sizes. Yes, um, for this particular uh, experiment, actually it's only in one city. It's not a very large area. And uh, we, we did this uh, at our initial um, exercises. Um, actually, uh, I would have to say classifiers plays a, a role. I'm just trying to, uh, uh, we did actually a survey of more than 6,000 uh, papers. We published a meta analysis of uh, global land cover. You know, it's actually localized uh, land cover at the whole world. And uh, we try to see, you know, uh, different people's finding. Lots of people would claim that they develop a new algorithm. So they, they improve the classification accuracy. You know, our uh, work here is trying to set a benchmark. You have the same set of data and see which algorithm is doing well or, uh, you know, better. So you pointed correctly that in this particular case, actually the LR, the logistic regression algorithm for this particular set of classification that they perform relatively higher than other uh, classifiers, uh, you know, using a small set of uh, samples for this set of data. But when you go to a lot larger areas, the classifiers sometimes they don't consistently uh, outperform another one. So that's why, you know, on the other hand, you will always be uh, feeling that, uh, you know, representative samples is important. So I think in the more general, uh, 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 when we generalize our observation and uh, uh, try to be uh, wiser on doing the analysis, we try to put more emphasis on how to build a good and representative and concise sample set. Uh, because the algorithms could be taken nowadays relatively easy. Thank you for your comment. Any other question? Uh, Guido? Thank you very much for the interesting talk. Also, maybe a slightly technical question. I didn't quite understand how you did your noise corrupting experiments. So you said you feed the algorithm 20% wrong data and the accuracy doesn't change. But how's that possible? Presumably the, ac the, the algorithm is a random number, predic a random predictor on the, on the wrong data, I guess. Well, what I, the, the, the meaning here is basically that, uh, you know, I have one set uh, around 10,000 sample locations. Uh, no, around 100,000 sample locations for the whole world. So I have samples. You know, when uh, I use all the samples, I don't have any choice. And I only have uh, this single set of samples. So uh, I could use a sample to train random forest classifier or any other classifier. In this case, I try to uh, change certain percentage of the categories. For example, if it is water, I randomly change it to, for example, grassland or whatsoever to a certain percentage. So then I will use that change. 5% of the samples are being altered and to train the random classifier, the random forest classifier, and then use that to classify a standard set of 38,000 sample uh, for validation. So I get the accuracy. 
So that's basically the exercise I'm showing you here. When I change 20% of the samples, I'm still able to have relatively robust uh, classification accuracy. So that means most of the algorithms have a, a certain level of robustness in uh, you know, sample error. So I use this to assume if my sample doesn't, uh, is correct, but my, uh, they are collected in different locations. Uh, they are correct for 2015, the year I collect the sample, but they may change in time in, two, uh, in 1985, for example. Then I would say the whole world didn't change 20%. They may change 5% or 10%, but not 20%. So uh, I could still use this setup. So this is basically uh, a test to show the uh, algorithm and sample validity in uh, extending it to a historical time. Okay, thank you very much. So I think... Uh... We thank again uh, Peng for this very interesting talk and uh